Okay, sorry, I've pumped this afternoon a bit, but um, I'll be fairly quick. On, I'm going to roll two talks together, and there are people in this room who are far, far more experienced in what I'm saying than, than myself. So if you want to make comments at the end, please do join in, because it's, you know, we all need to learn from each other. So I've been given the task of talking about endurance training, zone two, and HIT training. I had to look a lot of that up because I'm not a high-level athlete by any means, and this is all about um, you, know, you know, how people train for peak performance, really. And then I want to just go on and probably start off, really, with fueling strategies and the medication adjustments for people with type 1 diabetes who are doing quite a lot of exercise regularly. And I think... I'll go back to that little pie chart. How will you manage your activity around type 1 diabetes? Um, I'll be talking about this in more detail tomorrow. This is just the nuts and bolts of, of a general approach to how type 1 affects management, of, uh, affects how we manage our insulin around exercise, really. Um, but I must say that that is very important, I think, being somebody who regularly exercises is far more important than somebody who exercises irregularly um, because exercise, as we know, sensitizes our body to insulin. If you've got more muscle bulk, you've got more ability to hoover up excess sugar and you've got more chance of having insulin sensitivity. So building muscle bulk is quite important. So just a general approach. So when you start doing exercise, you have to think, well, what fuel do I have available to me? Um, so we don't have that much, um, well, we have a lot of different types of fuel f around the mac general macronutrients. So we have sugars, um, we have fats, and from fats we get ketone bodies, because ketones, as you know, are a result of fat burning. We have amino acids, which, which can be, be employed if we need to create more glucose. And um, if we're fasting, we have these... Um, structures in the cells called lysosomes which um, will help us to provide energy and also of course we have the need for oxygen in most cases but in anaerobic respiration we can't use oxygen because we haven't got any available so we use anaerobic respiration and I'll talk about that in just a second so we have fuel available to us a lot of it is taken from our stores and we have 2,000 calories roughly of glycogen, most of it's in the liver, some of it's in the muscle, and that's um, designed to be released rapidly, it's just glucose molecules linked together, and it's designed to be rapidly released um, in ana anaerobic respiration, and it will also support aerobic respiration. Uh, and we have a whopping 100,000 calories, I've got 85,000 calories of fat on board for whatever you want to use it for. Um, but it's there for physical activity if you want to use it. Um, so we have a huge store of um, energy available to us. And I think if we have type 1 diabetes and we're on a high carbohydrate diet, it would be very, very difficult for us with high carbohydrates and high insulin to free up our fat stores to um, make good use of them because insulin, as you know, blocks fat burning. So. I just want to talk really about where our power is generated. So that's an idealized cell, which m most of us would probably have done in biology at whatever level. Um, and just, <coughs> excuse me, around, whoops, there you go, there's another one. Um, just sort of in the cell, across the cell memory, that's where all the insulin acts around here. And this is where glycolysis takes place. So the breakdown of, of glucose takes place in the cell um, matrix itself. Um, and that generates a tiny amount of energy, relatively speaking, two molecules of ATP. Now, ATP, as we know, is the, 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 the power source, if you like, of the body. And when ATP levels drop, we have mechanisms in place to build it back up again, which is how we use our fuel. Um, so glycolysis by itself, um, to a certain level, produces a small amount of energy for us. And that's the sort of amount of energy you're getting when you're doing anaerobic respiration, tiny amounts. Uh, and then we have, um, oops, sorry, blind you. We have these structures here called mitochondria, which sit inside cells. And they can burn only in the presence of oxygen because the electron transport chain, which produces a lot of ATP, uh, only functions when you have oxygen at the end of it to, to, to 
to keep the electrons moving. So if you've got no electrons, you don't have any respiration, an aer aerobic respiration, so you're relying on burning without, um, without oxygen. And they, they generate a huge amount of energy, relatively speaking. It's quoted about 36 to 38 um, ATPs per turn of the, um, the cycle. I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, so the huge amount of energy, but they can only generate it in the presence of oxygen. Um, dephosphorylation, as I said, ATP going to ADP going to AMP, dephosphorylation of, of our energy stores drives us to produce more ATP, and that process produces phenomenal, requires phenomenal amounts of calories, as, as we know just from daily living. Anaerobic respiration is f more than 15 times less efficient than aerobic respiration, but it happens at a faster pace. Um, it's, it's a faster reaction. So overall, anaerobic respiration is about five times less efficient than, um, uh, than aerobic respiration. So the idealized cell looks like that. And uh, you know that's what most cells look like. I think that's a liver cell. It says, so the mitochondria packed in there. And the more mitochondria um, re re reflects the uh, energy requirement of the cell. They're very plastic things. They move around. You've got these structures here called lysosomes, which I'll talk about later. Um, and as you say, it's a whole mess, and, and, and the cell just moves around and does what it likes, depending on its energy requirements at the time. So a little bit complicated, but we'll get on with it. Um, this is called the Krebs cycle. Uh, or the citric acid cycle, because citric acid here is a six carbon unit and it relies on being fed by two carbon units. This is a four carbon unit, two carbon units to feed the cycle. And as you see, the cycle regenerates itself every time by being supplied with this chemical called acetyl CoA. So when you're burning your carbon, it is burned off as CO2. Um, and it's replenished by either burning of sugar, glycolysis, in the cell, which forms something called pyruvic acid. Now, pyruvic acid by itself is limited how much it can supply by this enzyme called pyruvic dehydrogenase. That's the rate limiting step um, for aer aerobic respiration, which is measured by sports people, and hopefully you'll be able to input that later on. Um, or it can be provided by the oxidation of fatty acids. So fatty acids at the end will chop off two carbons and this thing called beta oxidation, and they will produce equally acetyl-CoA. So whether we burn fat or sugar, we're actually producing the same chemical to burn it, to, to, to burn in the citric acid cycle. And then all of these uh, reduction reactions that are going on um, here you know, will produce electrons for taking down the electron transport chain. So mitochondria are very flexible in the types of food that they can have, but the, s the different foods will break down into the same products for feeding the cell. That's what I'm trying to say. And now, um, fatty acids by themselves, we're not sure whether they can be used up by neuronal tissue, but we know that ketone bodies can be used up by neuronal tissue, um, and ketones are converted uh, from acetoacetal acetoacetate into something called beta-hydroxybutyrate, which travels around the bloodstream, which is what we measure in the blood, and then it goes into the neurons, it's invited in uh, by these um, receptors, uh, and, and then it converts back to acetyl-CoA, so it keeps the Krebs cycle running within a neuron. So um, we have a very elegant system, and of course if we have too many ketones being produced by the brain and a fatty acid, we've got a fantastic system to excrete ketones by breathing them out or peeing them out. Uh, whereas with carbohydrates, we have no system for doing that apart from storing it as fat. It's just a different way of managing it. So a little bit complicated, but just trying to show that we can use multi-fuels um, and they come from different sources. But in the end of the day, we're fueling with, 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 with um, this, the same sort of chemical to, to, to generate our energy. And insulin is central, really, to energy management. In insulin allows glucose to be used. And, and, and I'll talk tomorrow about how insulin is used, uh, well, I'll talk later, actually, about how insulin is used in fasting. It moves uh, glucose into all cells. It's, 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 it's there. GLUT4 receptors are 
the, the cells that are well known in the muscle and the liver and the adipose tissue. And they sort of bob around under the surface of the um, cell wall and under the influence of lack of energy, they pop up onto the surface at, at a high rate and insulin can increase the rate of energy intake by about 40 fold uh, when your muscles are required to, to actually start doing some physical activity. Uh, insulin, as I said earlier, is anabolic and also excess fuel has to be managed by the body. So if you, ec if you eat too much, you need that to be managed and insulin is involved somewhere in that process. And don't worry, your body will do the worrying for you, okay? So, you know, don't rely. You know what happens when humans try to intervene with diet? We've had the low-fat diet for the next last 50 or 60 years, and that has really not helped our health or some people's health over that period of time. Um, and the other thing here, I think um, we talk about different fuels for different training zones. Um, so if you have sugar, if you want to burn sugar, it will burn anaerobically or aerobically, whereas fats will only burn aerobically. And protein breakdown can, be, can feed into both systems. Um, so I've been asked to talk about zone two training. Um, and it's talk, talking about improving mitochondrial flexibility by burning fat instead of burning sugar. Um, enables you to use fat as energy for a longer period of time. And therefore, the idea is that it will preserve your sugar stores called glycogen for when you need to do explosive activities such as anaerobic respiration, um, you know, sprinting 10, 10 second, 100 meters and things like that. Um, and it's by and large just jogging really, that sort of level tennis or those sort of activities. And I think you can measure it on some of your um, training watch watches, but I don't wear one at the moment. Um, so when we look at zone two and look at how insulin's managed around zone two, so first of all, if you have type one diabetes, it's, it's not as easy to burn fat as I've, as I've explained. So you need to really be in ketosis in order to burn fat well, you, you need to be in ketosis in order to take advantage of zone two training if you have type one diabetes. So that's denied to you really. Um, so I think when we look at, look at this pie chart here, we'll be concentrating on what foods we're going to fuel with if we want to train in zone two to improve our mitochondrial flexibility, whatever that means. Um, and we will need to take care of our environment, our hormones, that these people are really, really happy so they're not, they haven't got much stress on board, have they? They're, they're happy people. Probably got quite a lot of dopamine and, and, and all those sort of things going on. Um, and it depends what time of day you do this. You know, if you do this, you see people in gyms at night, don't you? Three in the morning, um, you know, struggling away. That will affect how your body responds to, to, to the fuel it's, it's being given. So this is um, a trace of someone who's um, doing long distance running. And this, this was effectively zone two, and, and it's a good glucose profile, because that is fueled on carbohydrates, it's not fueled on fat. It's, it's fueled on fat, sorry, um, not fueled on carbohydrates, um, because we know insulin blocks fat burning. So I wonder how different that would be if you're carb fueling. I think that'd be impossible to get such a good trace, um, personally. Um, so talk about high level intensity training, this is the late, well it was a few years ago, a bit of a buzz, everybody was doing HIT training, high intensity interval training, alternating short periods of intense explosive and, and anaerobic exercise with brief recovery to the point of exhaustion. I think the idea is it increases again your metabolic flexibility and, and it may improve, um, they think it improves um, performance uh, for, for athletes. Um, but looking at this pie chart here, so lots and lots of uh, lots of physical activity going on here. Nobody's looking particularly happy, and a lot of people, and, and certainly in my journeys throughout all this sort of sport, you know, some most of those people who wired up are containing more information than most intensive care units. Just the way we go, isn't it? And then you get over that sometimes, or or you want to carry it on. Lots of data, so quite a lot of stress and a lot of stress in the fact that you're doing anaerobic exercise so that will generate a lot of adrenaline and a lot of um, uh, hormones um, related to, to boosting your 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 um, requirements for for energy because anaerobic activity can't be sustained for long 
And I, I don't think people can sustain anaerobic activity for the length of time it takes to do a HIIT training for the majority of us. Majority of us. So they say that a HIIT would last typically 30 minutes um, or less, short burst, 20 to 30 seconds on, 10 seconds off. That's a huge amount of um, stress on the body, isn't it? It's massive anaerobic stress on the body. And they say avoid more than 75 seconds. Well, I don't think anybody could cope with anaerobic respiration for 75 seconds. What I've read is about, it's about 30 seconds to a minute, and you just run out of um, the ability to keep going with anaerobic respiration. You, have to, you wait for your oxygen to catch up, and then you can start burning, burning other fuels. You can start burning your glucose much more efficiently. Um, yeah, so obviously it improves glucose metabolism because that's the only thing you can burn. Uh, it's said to improve metabolic capacity, imp athletic capacity, but it, you, you have to um, get somebody here to, to explain that. Um, it's considered an excellent way to maximize workout in someone with time constraints, and I think that's quite significant. Um, now, when I was a, a, a child going to sort of elementary school, primary school, uh, we, I had to go about a mile and a mile and a half to walk to school in a rural area. And obviously, got tired from time to time. So my grandmother, who sort of used to take me to school, we did this thing, sort of running a lamppost and walking a lamppost, which, which is called fartlek training, I think, isn't it? You do a bit of anaerobic, a bit of aerobic respiration, although I didn't know that at the time. Um, so. I think that is a sort of pre-hit sort of thing, but it's less intense. Um, but now we've got, you know, there's a lot of money to be made in gyms. You know, gyms set up 30 minutes down the gym on the way home from work. It's a very convenient way of doing exercise. And a lot of people are developing a lot of regimens to, to, to cash in, really, on, on this um, performance orientated way of doing physical activity. But I think most of us aren't going to win gold medals and we have to put that into context and it may be it, it, people can comment on how they feel about hit I think but it may not be the best way to train for the majority of us being in a relaxed situation and being in, a, in an intense situation probably your stomach's full probably you've got a load of sugar on board which would be good to get rid of it but whether it, it is, is a healthy way of, of living I, 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 I pr probably doubt that so I want to consider really what you have to consider when you're doing, doing fueling for your sport is what is my body going to need for fuel? So am I going to do a lot of anaerobic respiration in which case you won't be burning any fat, you'll be burning your glycogen stores. Um, do I have enough fuel on board already? So I'll talk tomorrow about glycogen stores but the majority of people who aren't high level athletes will almost certainly have enough energy on board already. Um, the other thing people need to know is what is my insulin on board status? How much insulin is swelling around my, my, my blood right now? And will that come into play when I start to do some physical activity? Almost certainly yes. So you need to be able to manage your insulin on board. Um, <coughs> the less insulin you've got on board, the less likely you are to have a hypo because that's what it's all about. But if you're planning to do a lot of anaerobic exercise, you'll probably start to raise your blood sugar and you might need to think about anticipating that. Insulin is a finite resource for the body. And as I said, you think about it as electricity. Um, so you use it and then you replace it. And in a, in a non-type 1 setting, insulin will um, be used up and then you replace it so you have to inject more so you have to consider you might remember that graph where it went for a run and the the blood glucose went up you have to consider in a lot of anaerobic respiration whether or not you're going to need to supplement with insulin uh, before you do that activity or you may find you might need to do it afterwards but bear in mind that insulin may be required for intense anaerobic activity which is a little bit counterintuitive but insulin will be used up because it needs to get the sugar into the cell as quickly as possible. Um, so we're going to be talking in a second about fasting. So we talk about food or fast. Um, what do you do when you're doing physical activity? Well, most people have got more than enough fuel on board, so you need to add extra fuel in. It was sort of a revelation to me when 
I started to go keto, I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. So then I thought, I'll do, I don't know, half marathon a month, I think I set my challenge. So I'm not an athletic sort of person at all. And the first two half marathons, it was about um, bacon and eggs, you know, fueling with protein and fat before you did your physical activity. And second one was bulletproof coffees and all that, you know. And then it's suddenly, finally, duh, well, you've actually, why are you eating fat? Because you've got 100,000 calories ready to go. So why not just burn your fat at a slightly faster rate? Obvious, really. But it, it's one of those things we have to learn because we're always trained to fuel before we do physical activity. Um, so I think it's pretty safe, really, to fast, really. Um, if you're carb loading, if you're on a high carb diet, there are algorithms for that, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Otherwise, I think fasting's far more easy in most situations, and it will certainly um, help you to control your blood glucose much more effectively. Um, and you certainly won't run out of energy. So here's a study uh, or report, really, on ketogenic diet in athletes. Um, this is Karen Zinn and um, Fionn um, McSweeney and the other two researchers there. And, and they really just looked at performance of people on a ketogenic diet of moderate level athletes. And they wanted to know, does um, ketogenic diet affect me uh, performance for athletics? Because the general view is um, that sugar is the master fuel and fat just adds on a little bit at, uh, uh, to keep people supported. But fat is a, an inferior fuel to, to sugar. So they looked at this, and the summary, sorry, it's a bit of a death by PowerPoint here, but they said moderate intensity, uh, 60, 46 to 63% of your maximum, maximum oxygen capacity, so that's, that's jogging sort of thing really, isn't it? Um, they had no, um, whoops, sorry, they had no uh, decrease in uh, endurance capacity following 28-day adaption to ketogenic diet. So the length of time you take to adapt to ketogenic diet makes a big difference to the to the outcome. A lot of studies on keto diets have been done on 10-day, 12-day adaptations, which probably aren't enough. So vigorous intensity, which is what most athletes sort of go in for, um, they'd, they'd adhere to a ketogenic diet for at least, a bit, at least three weeks, often up to a month, and they maintained their time to exhaustion at 70% VO2 max. So, so fat, fatty diet did not affect their performance overall. And recreationally trained athletes, that's the rest of us, experience no decrement in performance following a 21 to 84 day keto adapted diet. So you can safely exercise fasted and burn fat and it will not produce a noticeable decrease in your performance. Um, there is a, a there is a caveat to that. I'll talk about that tomorrow because at very, very high levels of performance, you probably almost certainly need sugar. But for the vast majority of us, it burning fat is not a de detriment to your performance overall. So like me, if you're a two-hour half marathon, it's not going to make me run two hours, one minute, and I don't care as long as I can finish. So for the majority of people, it's not going to make a big difference. Um, and they, they came to the conclusion, they proposed the popularity of carbohydrate restricted approaches due to other reports. And they included the reports of improved energy for both training and competition, reductions in caloric requirements during training and competition because you're burning fat, um, reduced incidence of delayed onset of muscle soreness and gastrointestinal complaints. And I think that is definitely a biggie here. Um, when we did the 0 5 100, um, the 100 mile, none of us had any issues with recovery whatsoever. There's no muscle soreness at all. And because we weren't eating, we didn't get any gastrointestinal problems, obviously. Uh, nutrition has, has emerged as a potent modulator of inflammation over the past decade, and I think that's the, the, the best reason as to why we should consider doing our physical activity on a ketogenic diet, because at the end of the day, it's the inflammation that's going to get us. And if we do habitual exercise over decades, uh, and we're putting ourselves into an inflammatory state with high levels of insulin, it's probably not going to do us any good, even though we're, it will, to some extent, physical activity will offset the uh, incidence and of uh, earlier complications. But I think if you've got some evidence that nutritional ketosis is better, I think that's what the way I would go. So just add on to this, it's the same sort of thing, really, fasting. 
And there are people in the audience I know who are far more qualified than me with this, so if you want to chip in, please do. So why do we fast? Well, people do religious fast, don't they? Uh, people fast for financial reasons. You know, if 10% of the population are on less than a dollar a day and can just can't eat, and um, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, people fast because they're ill, um, whether it's anorexia, um, they have a calorie deficit because of Crohn's disease, bowel obstruction, poorly controlled di diabetes. Some people choose not to eat because they realize that food affects their blood glucose, and this is a big problem um, with, with eating disorders. Um, people with pneumonia physically just don't want to eat and can't eat. People who have got bowel problems uh, after bariatric surgery, some people just can't eat because the the band or the, the way the Rouen Y, the, the surgical technique, um, makes it difficult for them to eat. Um, alcoholism, people just drink alcohol all the time, don't they? The end stage people with poor people who can't uh, control their alcohol intake. And, and some people with cancer, when their bodies are breaking down, they just stop eating as an end stage. And of course, people fast for health, and that's increasingly becoming something that probably everyone in this room knows about and has tried at one time or other. Um, so what's the benefit of fasting, or what's the point of it, really? Well, you use less insulin as someone with type 1, so um, you get less inflammation in your body, so less sort of um, chance of, of, of getting ill, really. And as I say, it reduces the requirement for insulin, as your ketones are your predominant fuel. And it involves intracellular energy management pathways, and I'll just go into this a little bit, but I don't want to go into it too much because it's difficult for me <laughs> to understand as well. But um, these structures here, which I talked about before, called lysosomes, they are actually structures within the cell that um, are involved in uh, housekeeping for the cell. So bits of mitochondria, when the, when the, 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 the cell's not doing much, the mitochondria just break down because it doesn't need them, and they get stored in the lysosomes, and they get excitotes, they just get sent out into the bloodstream and the liver has to put up with them or the kidney has, uh, is given the, the chance of sorting them out. Um, so when you're fasting and not eating, that puts a certain stress on the cell. So the cell is requiring f energy and if you've decided you're fasting, the cell is not getting that energy. So the ATP is being used up and it's generating, uh, it's, it's producing something called ADP and that generates the need for um, more fuel. So it's got to find some fuel from somewhere. And what it does, this guy got a Nobel Prize for this in the, in the 80s, I think. But what it does, these lysosomes break down and they're full of amino acids because most cells are full of protein. Uh, and the body can utilize that protein for its own use, so it's for its energy requirements. So what an elegant system, really. Um, but the other interesting thing is that while it's doing that, it preserves the essential amino acids so they don't get used up, they get reprocessed by the body, so it only uses the non-essential amino acids, which is, which is a great idea. Um, it was initially seen in response to starvation, but now research has shown that it's, it's normal in a fasted state. Um, yeah, so it reduces inflammation um, and is considered, time-delayed eating is now considered a healthy practice. I um, don't know why that's all there, sorry about that. Um, mitochondria themselves, which they're very sensitive to energy demand, so they can, they can be, be doubled, tripled in number very quickly, or they can, they can be reduced in number by being broken down. And the more that there's an energy demand on the cell, the more um, uh, things called Christi, which are the, the, um, the, the, the filaments in the mitochondria that cause the chemical reactions, that host the chemical reactions, that they produce more and more of them. So interesting structures, mitochondria, involved in um, fasting through, through autophagy. Um, bum bum, forget all that. Right, so there's something called mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, which is an anti... An, uh, uh, a sort of a, an anti-cell generation um, product um, which, which is used in, in cancer treatment. And mTOR activates um, reduction in mTOR. So mTOR is anabolic. It, it is involved in cell growth, cell replication, etc. 
And when the amino acid supply is deleted, it's mTOR stops and, 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 and autophagy can start using all the, the waste products of the cell. Um, so M, the inhibition of mTOR by um, autophagy um, promotes amino acid recycling of, of, um, of, for the cell and it makes the cell very much more efficient. Um, I won't go too much through this, but there's, there, are other, there are three main energy uh, regulatory pathways in every cell. There's one called protein kinase B, which some people know as AKT, and that's equally involved in inhibition of, 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 of um, cell breakdown. Uh, and it also has a function in helping the GLUT4 receptor move from the cytoplasm, as I said before, they bounce up and down, and under the influence of lack of energy, they go straight to the surface, and if any insulin's around, it will hoover up the sugar very, very quickly. So these, these structures are, are very important in the, in the cell too. And there's another one called protein phosphoinositide 3 kinase, which is linked to insulin and its metabolic effects, and all three of these enzymes together help with the cell energy balance. And insulin's involved in somewhere, somewhere in that, that chain. So you don't want too much insulin because it will, in, it will sort of cause an alteration of the energy balance at the cellular level. So fasting is a good way of, of, of cleansing your body, really. And how long should you fast for? Well, how long should you fast for? Well, 12 to 18, uh, 18 hours uh, is the, when autophagy is thought to start, 16 hours, so 16, 8, so eating in an 8-hour window, eating in a 6-hour window, something like that. Um, we fasted for five days on this, this run, and we didn't seem to have any problems at all. We were a little bit concerned, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, as to whether or not we would start breaking down our protein, so um, that's an interesting one, but five days of fasting seems pretty safe. Um, I think if you just start it as someone with type 1 diabetes, you must be, be careful that you are good at managing insulin, because it's all about insulin, this, isn't it? You, your insulin requirements will decrease quite a lot when you're fasting. Uh, you'll probably even halve your normal insulin requirements. So, so just take care if you want to fast um, with, um, with type 1 diabetes. And just a practical application, really, once you've You've, you've cracked the process of basal calibration. You can choose to eat when you want, and that's such a freedom thing for people with type 1 diabetes. So if you don't want to eat, you don't have to eat, and you know your blood sugar will be great. Um, so I think, I think that's quite important. And, you know, the, you can safely skip breakfast if you're keto-adapted. You don't need to worry. I mean, that's, that's the easiest way to fast, is, is fast overnight, and you've already got 12 hours under your belt before you, you, you start your other fast. Just as an example, yesterday when I was coming over here, um, long haul, two meals on the flight, I decided I didn't want to eat anything because I knew what the airline meals would be like and I wasn't disappointed. Um, so y your options are, aren't they? You can, you can put up with it, there's nothing wrong with, with eating carbs from time to time, so you can just put up with it, inject your insulin, hope for the best, and you're, you're stuck you know, doing no exercise at all. So you're completely relying on your liver to do all of the processing for you. So you hope you've managed your insulin with your, with your carbs and protein efficiently. Um, but, but of course, in, in two, you know, two meals, three hours apart, you'll be, you'll be subjecting yourself to insulin stacking. So you'll be taking another insulin dose before the previous dose has worn off. And then when you get off the plane, you've got all the hassle of finding your bags and all that and getting out. And, and that may start to stimulate your use of insulin through exercise. So, you know, it's not just, not just about improving your overall health, but it's being able, as someone with type 1 diabetes, to, to have the freedom to do what you like, when you like, much more so than when you're, you're tied into high-carb regimens and high doses of insulin. So there are, there are benefits to fasting beyond, um, if I got that pie chart up, where is it? There are benefits to fasting beyond um, your, your, your general sort of physical health. It, it cuts across things like physical activity. You can do physical activity just as well fasted as not, as a type one, someone with type 1 diabetes. Clearly it impacts that because you won't need any insulin to cover your food. And it, it will impact your, your mental health because you have that freedom to do what you like. So it's not just about physical health, it's about 
It's about holistic health, and fasting is, is an easy win for people with type 1 diabetes. And when we talk about fasting, it's considered sort of breaking down your body, but a 16-hour fast is probably normal for, for our, our uh, ancient ancestors and who just couldn't get access to food. And, of course, our ancestors would never eat before they went to catch anything because they would only go, you know, most of us, if we've got a fridge full of food, we're not going to go shopping, are we? You know, you would only eat when you were hungry and you start chasing food down when you were hungry. So I think it has, it, it's a useful s strategy for people with type 1 in, and added to physical activity and controlling your diet. So we're starting to build up a picture of this holistic care and manage, management of diabetes around insulin rather than just worrying about counting your carbs and shooting up as much insulin as you need. So I think that, that'll do really. Anybody got any questions at all? Please do. Hello again. Hi. Uh, so, um, I mean, we're we're at a type one diabetes conference, so I understand where a lot of people would feel like fasting. I mean, we 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 run into blowback when we ask to dilute insulin with our endocrinologists. So, bringing up the topic of fasting for even Belinda said like fasting is four to six hours for her, which I would somewhat disagree because you're still postprandial for five hours with a protein meal. So I, I do like the idea that fasting is 12 hours to 18 hours, and I think that gives us time to uh, figure out and dial in basal rates. Um, but I, I, I just, in kind of um, like a perspective on exercise, like I want to keep in mind to people that the exercise that you do is the, that, that you can do is the exercise that's best, because I'm not sure if anyone besides me in this room would be interested in running 100 miles in a week. Um, maybe you, but it's, it's, it's a fairly small niche. So, I mean, I love that, you know, like it's something that I think we have in common. I think it might miss the point with the general population a, a bit, but I love what it proves because we are capable of it and I love doing that. Um, that said, like um, kind of reading through how Bernstein trains, uh, he's a big proponent longevity and health wise of strength training. Yeah and uh, with muscle mass and muscle being a sink. So I, I know that that's a benefit, but it's much harder to manage insulin and blood sugar control around strength training for, for many people, especially if you're not doing it frequently. I find the endurance sports, you know, like it gives you this insulin sensitivity change where you need to reduce a temp basal and then it kind of holds during the activity and it can actually be like, just set it, forget it, and hold that intensity for 10 hours until you're done and it's simple. Whereas if you're doing sprint workouts or hit workouts, it's much more dynamic and harder to manage because it's a, an elevation of the speed of the roller coaster at which diabetes comes at you. Um, I wonder if you have, uh, just by you kind of having a personal preference, or is there a, a physiological like reason why you prefer uh, the zone two training over the harder to control, but maybe more rewarding as far as like, um, um, muscle growth and longevity or yeah. whatever Bernstein kind of prioritizes because he'll include a, a, a maximum heart rate workout each week and then he'll work on kind of bodybuilding type activities. Yeah. But, um, yeah, well, thank you for your comments because you, I think you're more expert than me in that high level athletic performance. I mean, my, my view for type 1 would be, you know, you will get a, a variety of, of, um, of different uh, activities throughout the week depending on what you're doing so you talk you talk muscle built muscle building you know that, that's possible for everyone to do at different times of, of, of the week but it, unless I think unless you're training specifically for something just enjoying yourself is probably a good start and um, you know you will get a bit of um, uh, zone two but hey you might go and run up a hill and then you'll get a bit of zone three or you might decide to, you, you know, go and do some cycling. So I think that for most people, being habitually someone who exercises is more important than how long you exercise. It depends on what you're training for. So I think a hit training person would probably kill me. Um, but other people who, who, are, who are younger would probably feel that that's something they want to do because it does give you a certain buzz, doesn't it, with, with the anaerobic respiration and the lactic acid buildup and the general feeling of, of wellness after you've done all that and the adrenaline rush. 
So I think it's very personal, but I mean, I just think people should be aware that exercise is accessible and it's just easier to exercise at any, any level if you are mindful of how you manage insulin. And the best way to exercise is probably for the majority of people with type 1 is to exercise with no food in their stomach because it makes calculations so, so much easier. So when Bernstein talks about how he exercises in the book, uh, he'll have his routine where he's going through his uh, cycle of machines and um, he's on, a, I believe, Levomir insulin, so it's fairly adjustable, but he doesn't like set a temp basal on a pump sure. before he, he sure. trains. So what he's doing is uh, pr kind of predicting his glucose requirement and, uh, and I've kind of gone to this too where I'm just like, uh, if I'm burning through those glucose um, calories, like a liquid glucose, um, if I need 12 grams after 40 minutes of, of a, a strength workout, I, I don't count that as anything that it's not requiring insulin from me, it's not affecting sure. anything in my metabolism, it's mm. just saving me from having to think upstream and plan my insulin requirement before that workout, or you know, I can just kind of, um, like it's easier to fix lows than highs, mm. more or less, so... Um, I, I, I just wonder where your stance is. I, I understand there's benefits to fasting. I also feel like Bernstein kind of knows his stuff. So uh, Absolutely. I, I think Richard Bernstein is amazing. I mean, 80-odd, fit yeah. as a fiddle. Yeah. He's an example of how regular physical activity is beneficial, I think. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of the di di type 1 community, they, we, they hear things that are, are said and kind of take them as doctrine, and so they would become afraid to consume glucose, you know, even during exercise because they want to be fasting, but I would almost consider that as oh. still fasting more or less because those glucose calories are getting disposed just like your glycogen from your muscles. Absolutely, it's, it's necessary to be yeah. used. It's a bit like insulin, you have to use it, and, yeah. and, and glucose, the same. fuel is the same, isn't it? If you've yeah. got enough fuel, if you, haven't lit, if you don't have enough fuel, yeah. especially with, when you're on insulin, you have to fuel it somehow. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to end up finding an ambulance person standing over you. So. Yeah. Fueling is, I, I, I agree completely, but I think regular physical activity is the thing. Yeah. How, how you choose to do that is entirely up to you. Thank Hi. you, Ian. Mark Kukasala, fellow aging, low carb runner. Hi. <laughs> I've, Hi uh, thank you so much uh, for coming over. It's, it's huge and it's a privilege to have you. I followed you all on that, on your five, or zero, one hundred, five days, and I'm curious. How, like just your recovery, that took a lot of guts. I, I probably couldn't do that for one day to not eat, and you did it for five, so, that, so congratulations <laughs> on that. That took a lot of courage, but how was your... <laughs> you. Yeah, I mean, that's hard. How was your recovery? Like, because we always hear, okay, you gotta have the protein like right after you finish exercising, and then there's a group that says, oh, it's fine to have the protein, you know, for dinner later that night, but you didn't have any protein for five days. Yeah. How was just your strength? After, what did you find? You, you you got more vigor, or did you lose some of that after? Days I'll talk about that five? tomorrow. Okay. I'll talk about that in detail tomorrow. But it wasn't a problem. Um, I, when I conceived it, it was one of those early morning things, you know. And I I knew it was possible, but I didn't know it was survivable. If you see what I mean. Um, so it was a bit of a risk, to be honest. And you know, we got a lot of enthusiastic people to to have a go. Um, but it wasn't a problem with, with recovery. Why we did, only did five days is because we didn't want to put ourselves into the situation where we might start to require to burn protein to provide our, our glucose for us. We, we weren't sure. So we didn't want to go into, into starvation because that wasn't what we wanted to prove. We didn't want, it, this was never intended ever to be a destruction test. This was intended to be a scientific validation of... Um, ketogenic diets in, in, di in type 1 diabetes. So we were, we were trying to push the envelope, say, well, how deep into ketosis do we need to get before, um, before it, people accept it as actually, yes, you are in ketosis. So we, we, we went to 25,000 calories of, of, of output to make absolutely sure that we'd use at least 10 times our glycogen, even if you think the glycogen de diminishes, if you see what I mean, and that's controversial, isn't it? <laughs> And, and we went five days because we, we thought that's the length of time we needed to go to get 25,000 calories burned, and that was sort of what we thought we, we could burn okay. Um, 
So, so th this wasn't a stunt in that way. It was designed to try to reassure clinicians that ketogenic, was, ketogenic diet was safe, really, and you could exercise quite safely, fasted, and in deep ketosis. And, and I'll talk about that tomorrow, but it wasn't a problem. And the ketone effect on the brain is, is amazing. You know, you just, you just get dialed up, and, and, and it's great. So there, there are no issues with that. In fact, we had a consultant psychiatrist who came, came to see us because one of her colleagues was joining us on the run. And um, we, on day four, we only had 12 miles to go. We nearly finished. And we, we, we were all OK, and everybody was in great spirits. And she was actually quite shocked to see how well we looked. We were actually, you know, we were, we were OK. And I think she expected to see us all sort of you know, I can imagine, you know, dragging ourselves, <laughs> looking really angry and staring at food. And we were actually opposite. Our, our hotel was opposite a, a whole series of restaurants, a bit like down, down here. So all the, all the aromas were wafting, but we still weren't tempted. It was fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a shame that you couldn't join us because you were actually primed up to join us, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I think it was the pandemic. <laughs> Next time. Next time. N never, never. <laughs> 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 so, uh, one quick question, you know, I, anybody who's had the opportunity or the luxury to you know, use a continuous glucose monitor, I think one of the first observations my patients tell me is when I exercise, my blood sugar goes through the roof. And these are non-type 1, non-type 2, sometimes just pre-diabetic, sometimes patients with just insulin resistance. Uh, even in my own self, I've seen my blood sugar go to 200 with a high-intensity interval workout. Uh, so, but what happens just, just within half an hour after that is uh, uh, extreme glycemic dipping. So I'm wondering, um, can you give us some insight as to how you would dose, say, yourself yeah. Uh, insulin in a scenario like that and versus maybe a more moderate workout and, and yeah. can you give us some clinical insight on well, exercise and insulin yeah I think, I think intense physical activity will obviously stimulate all of the stress response hormones and, and stick your sugar up because if you, some of it will be anaerobic so you, you're going to have to produce glucose from somewhere so you're going to drag it out of your glycogen stores you're probably going you know your liver's going to be, be active you may uh, attract some gluconeogenesis, probably not at that stage, but there's no doubt you're, you will not almost certainly have enough insulin on board if, if you're um, just dosing normally. So you're producing a situation where you just physically haven't got enough insulin in your body, if you see what I mean. So you inject it, do your physical activity, get tired out after 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever. Your insulin hasn't really started working at that stage. So, so then your, your body's trying to recover, isn't it? So insulin will be still probably trying to replace any glycogen that you might have used anaerobically. So it'll be sucking sugar out of your bloodstream. And then your insulin that you've, you've used to correct that uh, rise will start working a bit later on. So it, it's a bit of a risky strategy, really. Um, what I do personally, well, I don't really do too much anaerobic respiration if I, if I don't have to, for that reason. I, I, I don't think it would, it would suit, um, really. Um, but for those that do, I, I think if you're fasted, you've got less worry because you've got less insulin on board, but then you might just need to add a little touch an hour or so before you start doing the activity and see what happens. But if you're only using one unit, you're only going to drop your blood glucose depending on your insulin sensitivity, of course. Uh, you know, across the old person like me, about two and a half or something. So the majority of people, it would be no more than three, three and a half for the, for the average person. So you've got relative safety, and I think you'd be able to be shored up by, by, other, horm by other hormones when your insulin cuts in and you stop doing physical activity. But it is, it, is, it is a challenge, which is why a lot of people don't even start to think about doing physical activity. But that, that's what I would do. I'd anticipate that my insulin is going to run out, if you see what I mean. Or I'd become more insulin sensitive when I do the physical activity. So I'm insulin sticking onto the, 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 the muscle cells and hoovering the sugar out. Um, and you, you just have to, to think about, you know, replacing sugar if necessary. And a CGM is, is pretty well compulsory, I think, for type 1. It's, it's certainly highly desirable. And I don't know whether in your country it's free, but in the UK we can get it for free now, which is fantastic. Well, we pay taxes for the National Health Service, but... It's remarkable that we can access it, and I think it, it makes life so, so much easier. It takes the guesswork out of things. You can start to see the, 
the, the dive of a blood glucose well before you, you know, need to take action. Yeah, no, Is that what you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm learning. So, uh, you know, even in my own self, and I will, I'll, I'll keep this to the last question, I guess, uh, my own glycemic variability can be through the roof. Yeah. And I, I just sympathize with the plight of somebody who's managing it without a pain, you know, without a fully functioning okay. pancreas. Uh, yeah. I'd imagine it's, you know, considerably harder. I've seen my sugar go from 200 to 80 yeah. um, in a matter of minutes, you know. And so I'd imagine, you know, I just want some understanding of the, you know, do you let it ride? Like, I let it ride, you know, because my body's going to pick up the slack. I think you could let it ride if you're, if you're on a high-carb type of diet. You've probably got more insulin on board than you need, so you could probably let it ride then, knowing that it will settle itself down. I think it's, it, we're all different, as I said, 40 million people worldwide, 40 million ways of managing, and I think the physical activity is exactly the same. So you could let it ride if you don't mind having a sort of, uh, you know, 180, 200, like, like you say. You could let it ride, and it will probably settle itself down as your relative hyperinsulinemia sort of cuts in and just takes control of the situation. Or you may feel that you're so insulin sensitive that you just run out of insulin and you need more because your pancreas will produce insulin, if you see what I mean. So, so it's so much easier. So, so you don't have to worry about how much insulin you take because your pancreas will sort that problem out for you. And we have to anticipate with a, a very delayed response, even the most rapid-acting insulins, which are designed obviously for a high-carb environment, even the most rapid-acting insulins will take an hour or so to, to, to kick in. So you know, it's like driving a car and having to turn the steering wheel and then it'll turn an hour later for you. It's quite difficult to, to manipulate the situation. So experience, taking care with the sort of exercise you do, I think, as well. Um, if you can find alternatives that you personally feel are easier for you, I, I would personally do that. But yeah, you can let it ride. I think I would probably take a tiny, tiny bit of insulin just before, but other people would probably take a different approach and always have the glucose tablets ready just in case you start to find a dip. Thank Difficult. You. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, John. Hi, Dr. Lake. Um, so just a quick question. Obviously, we've talked a lot about CGMs, and you mentioned about um, that insulin can have a blocking effect on ketosis. Yeah. So yeah, does, yeah. do ketones matter to a type 1? In what way? Well, that's why I'm asking you. you. How do you know that you are in ketosis? Is, is there a potentiality of not being in ketosis and then having an adverse effect on, on it? Or is it just, for you guys, it's solely CGMs? Ketosis? Yeah. Do you measure ketosis? Yes. I mean, I think you Very do occasionally. I've, I've got a keto mojo. Yeah. So that's the only way I measure ketosis. But do, do you find for, for a type 1s that there is a need to do that or not? Or do you um, do it for curiosity? It's for, for a type 1, I think when you're getting started, it's worth seeing what level of ketosis you're in. And of course, if, if you get ill um, or your blood glucose starts to rise and you, you can't work out why, you need to see if you're, you're headed for ketosis. But for, you know, once you get used to the level that you're at, um, then it, it doesn't really change that much. So I, I th the problem is it's the hyperinsulinemia which blocks it, so it's more difficult to get into ketosis. So once you get to a certain level, it's very unlikely to change significantly. I'll show you the graphs tomorrow of the ketones that we got on the 05100. But I don't think it's absolutely necessary to measure regularly unless you, you're desperate to be in ketosis. Um, and of course, then, then people will, will try to, to, to measure that to find out. But I don't think it's mandatory, but I think it's important at the start for people to get a handle on what ketosis means and how certain fuels will produce ketones and how certain insulin regimes will inhibit ketones. And, and that is a useful learning exercise. So for the first three to six months, I think it's very, very useful for type ones. And then after that, I haven't measured my ketones for weeks, but you know, it, it's just to keep a check to see if, it's, if, if I am in ketosis is, is reasonable enough, because I don't think there's any risk of DKA at all. Right. And then with the advent of CKMs, which is really nice to actually yeah. see continuous ketone monitors, yeah. do you think that for more um, elite type 1 athletes that they could utilize these to really work what their carb edge is? Because obviously you don't want to go over that metabolic edge whilst you are running. So when you're doing the 0, 0500, how did you maintain so that you're in that total fat burning mode and not going over, if you will? 
we didn't know that uh, we just measured ketones and um, we, we didn't know because we weren't it wasn't about performance training for us it was about completing the distance whether you ran it or walked it it wasn't a problem so so it was important to measure ketones to for, certainly for type ones to see if we were going into DKA um, but for the others they, they measure ketones as well but whether it inhibited performance I, I don't know you'll probably have more to input than that but clearly if you've got things like cancer and want to go on to keto diet and and you know, if you want to ensure you're in ketosis on a, in a metabolic state like type 2 diabetes, it's quite useful to get to get to know what your ketones are doing. But, you know, it's hard for type 1s to, to maintain ketosis.